Author Kenneth Davis, where did the Don't Know Much series of books come from? Where did that idea come from? Well, the idea for the, uh, for the series came from my own little brain, although it didn't start out as a series, Peter. It really started out with the idea that I loved American history. I wanted to write about it. I wanted to write it about it in a way that shared my enthusiasm for a subject that I'd loved since I was a small child. Um, the title uh, came, of course, from Sam Cooke's wonderful song, uh, which I knew from childhood, uh, and, and so it got stuck in my head. And certainly the success of the book, which caught me by surprise more than anyone else perhaps, uh, led to the beginning of a series. Uh, geography followed and then uh, on and on it went from there. So with no pretensions of writing a series of books, I did set out to write this book because simply I loved American history. I couldn't understand why people said they were bored by it. I couldn't understand why we had these surveys that said 17-year-olds don't know their American history. And I wanted to write something that I thought would address that problem. And in 1991, you published your first one, Don't Know Much About History, Everything You Need to Know About American History But Never Learned. In that book you write, I like to consider a don't know much about book the first word on the subject rather than the last. That's, that's very true. I see myself as somebody who brings together a lot of really interesting information that exists out there. It's not that I'm a groundbreaking researcher who finds the uncovered story. I think that most of these stories exist. They unfortunately don't find their way into our textbooks, into our school books, certainly not into the mass media or Hollywood, which is where most people get a lot of their impressions of history. So I wanted to be a person who asks and then answers questions and then don't know much about series is written in a uh, question and answer format and be able to say what does the Declaration of Independence declare? What is the Mayflower Compact? Answer it in a, a few short paragraphs or pages but also direct people on to where they can read more about this. Uh, so I see myself in a way as, a, as an educator. Uh, many people say, did you, know, what, did you always plan to be a writer? And the fact is, no, I, I didn't. I, if I thought anything when I was in high school and certainly in college, that I would be a teacher. So I see my role uh, as partly as just starting a bigger conversation about history. And again, sharing my own enthusiasm and interest for history because it does have so much to do with who we are as a people today, what's going, certainly what's going on in the country right now, and when you see history not just as a long list of dates and battles and speeches, which is unfortunately how way too many people do see it in this country, it becomes a lot more interesting and we connect the history to the headlines, the past to the present, uh, and that's the real reason for understanding history in the first place. In an updated version of your Don't Know Much About History book you write, history is really about the consequences of our actions, large and small. And that has never been more apparent than in the aftermath of the terror attacks on September 11, 2001. If the terror attacks haven't changed anything else, they certainly changed many Americans' appreciation of the past and what it has to do with the present. What does that mean? Well, I'd like to think that that's true, and I believe it's true. You know, so many people, when we did have this catastrophe, wanted to know, first of all, was there anything else like this in our history? And in fact, there have been 9-11 moments throughout our history. I point to a, a few of them uh, in, in, in my books. Um, there was a moment in the 19th century called Dade's Massacre. It happened in the early 1830s. Uh, it was the, uh, the complete obliteration of a small uh, troop of men, army soldiers, marching from one place to another in Florida, which was uh, really like the far side of the moon to most Americans at the, that time. And uh, what that did was set in motion uh, a, a moment that led to a war against the Seminole Indians, one of the m overlooked moments in our past, which is something else I've always tried to do, tell the stories that the textbooks do leave out. Most Americans have never heard of the longest, most costly war in American history up until Vietnam, which was the Seminole War fought in Florida. So that moment was as gripping and astonishing in a way to people of that time as 9-11 was to us. Pearl Harbor certainly was again. So each generation has had one of these moments and we do forget that we've been through this before. Obviously we're going through it right now in, in a sense. 
Uh, I'm a New Yorker. I'm here in New York, and we are living through this extraordinary moment. And I just want to say briefly thank you uh, to the people who are expressing such concern and care for New York and this, and this region. We have a long way to go and a lot to do. In fact, on my way into the studio this morning, I was remembering Thomas Jefferson's words when he was inaugurated. We are all Federalists. We are all Democrats or all Republicans. And he was speaking to this moment when there was such division in the country. And this is why history can be so instructive. He was speaking to this moment in 1801 when they'd just come through a, a very, very mean and controversial election uh, that was decided in the House of Representatives. And he wanted to speak to this idea that we were all Americans again. And um, certainly that's kind of the way I wish we would feel after uh, the storm and the, the aftermath of that. So we can learn from these moments. Americans are very good at coming together. It doesn't feel that way right now So we, uh, in the midst of this election, but we also have this extraordinary moment where we have a, a crisis and a moment of division but butting heads against each other. And I, I'm hopeful that we can learn from our history and see that Americans do respond to a crisis like this. As Kenneth Davis alluded to, uh, the reason he's in New York and Book TV is back here in Washington is because of Sandy. We had some studio issues, so we're a little patched, patched together for this in-depth with Kenneth Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis, your most recent Don't Know Much book is Don't Know Much About the American Presidents. And you talk about uh, a couple of elections. I want to look at the election of 1800 and then the election of James K. Polk uh, versus Henry Clay. And you compare those talking about how vicious they were. Uh, is today's election, the current one we're in, vicious compared to the, the ones we just talked about? Uh, actually, no, it's probably more gentle by comparison. If you look at some of the things that were said, for instance, going back even further to 1796, the first contested election, when John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, the, the compatriots 20 years earlier who had combined to really bring the Declaration of Independence into being, were now fierce political rivals. While they had maintained a, 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 a friendship of sorts, as Jefferson served as Adams's vice president, which was the result of the way presidents and vice presidents were elected back then, uh, something that changed soon after, um, Jefferson and, and Adams had begun to form what were the beginnings of the two political parties. Adams, a Federalist, along with Alexander Hamilton, who was no great friend or ally of John Adams, by the way, and Jefferson on the other side with what were then known as the Democratic Republicans. And that's why I alluded to the fact that Jefferson, when he's inaugurated, says, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans, trying to bridge the separation. Um, so that election had begun with complaints that Adams was a monarchist, uh, there were newspapers of the day, the Aurora, perhaps the most famous of them in Philadelphia, published by Benjamin Franklin's grandson, that called uh, Adams a, uh, an overweight, uh, corrupt monarchist. Uh, he was accused of sending his vice presidential candidate, uh, Thomas Pickering, out to procure young girls for the two of them. Adams had the good humor to re reply, at least, that um, uh, he didn't know what happened to his two. P Pickering must have kept all four for himself. Jefferson was described as an atheist, a Jacobin, which was, in those days, the equivalent of palling around with left-wing terrorists. Jacobins were those who favored the French Revolution and what was going on. They said if Jefferson would, was elected, they would be, there would be blood in the streets and rape would be taught in all the schools. Uh, this was the tenor of the time. Obviously, back then, they did not have 24-7 news uh, stations. They did not have Twitter and Facebook to feed this frenzy, but it was still the frenzy of the day. Uh, 1824, another tremendous example of a vicious, a vicious election, uh, John Quincy Adams versus uh, uh, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was accused of being an adulterer and a bigamist because of a, a quirk in his divorce proceedings of, of, his first, uh, of his wife, Rachel, from her first marriage. But something that was circulated around the whole country was called the Coffin Handbill. 
It was a, a, a pamphlet, a broadside, that was posted throughout the country showing coffins. These were the men that Andrew Jackson had supposedly killed, either as a general.